unfortunately, we had a little bit of technical difficulties, although that is not something that is new. Um, we always do, it seems like. Um, but uh, Dr. Joy is on an interesting call with a couple of um, actors right now around some uh, philanthropic work they want to do. So we're going to start our um, Well This Wednesday without her, and she will be joining in. Um, so the topic today was really talking about Kisarian Gera, which is um, a saying um, among the Maasai uh, community um, around that means power the children. It's actually a greeting that different community members will offer to one another, um, even if the community member who's being talked to doesn't have children. Um, the idea is that if I say, how are the children? your response would be all the children are well. Um, and that is an indication of how the society is doing, um, how well people are thriving and communicating with one another is really gauged upon um, how the children are. And so when we think about that, um, and that's among you know the warriors who even um, speak to one another this way and greet each other this way. So we're thinking about what's happening in this um, country and in our community with all of the things that our kids are seeing, it's definitely something to, to consider. You know, how are our children doing through all of this? Um, when you see, you know, massacres and different things that have happened on college campuses, you will notice that psychologists and psychiatrists will come out and they'll say, well, you know, this is how you should talk to your children about what they're seeing. Um, this is how you help them navigate the trauma that they may feel by understanding that someone may have been shot or killed and they kind of give you, oh, oh she's back. Hi, there she is. Um, I'm talking about- How beautiful you are. Oh, how beautiful you are. I'm just actually was just talking about, um, just getting started and we we're just talking about Kassir and Gera and um, the saying, the greeting, how are the children and the response. And we're talking about, or we're talking about, I'm talking about since you were gone. Um, I'm talking about, um, the considerations that people make when there are um, catastrophes or, or um, massacres in the community, how they go about supporting children. You know, think about, you know, this is what you can help your child navigate this trauma. And that, that doesn't happen for our kids. Right. There's no, you know, like you say, there's no Dr. Phil that comes out. There's no, um, you know, even, you know, you don't have any of the, even the black psychologists uh, are not given a platform to come out and say, you know, what does it mean for black children when they're seeing people who look like them murdered, killed, and especially when they're murdered and killed by people who look like them, and especially when they're murdered and killed by people who are supposed to protect them, like the police. Um, so we wanted to kind of explore that process and the things that we can do to um, create an armor for our kids so that they can still thrive, still grow, um, despite the fact that we have all these things happening. So that was just introducing our topic. Excellent, excellent. So um, I just actually got off a uh, panel, which was really interesting because the panel was largely um, Muslim. So it was a Muslim panel and um, there was representative uh, Bass, I might be saying her right, amazing, uh, you know, par, uh, head of the um, Congressional Black Caucus. And I mean, just a wonderful folks were on. Mahershala uh, uh, was on was on as well. And and the conversation, the last question before I had to, to get out of there was, how do we in a in a world that seems to be rife with hatred and violence, how do we instill in our children a sense of safety and hope and care and these kinds of things? And I think um, I may have talked about it last time, I'm not sure, but you know, it bears repeating. And that is the whole notion of, of efficacy, right? So we have to remember no, ma no matter how deep it is right now, um, you know, we're not enslaved. People are not selling, <laughs> to my knowledge, are not selling our children into slavery, raping our wives and husbands and everybody. They are, they are it's just not sanctioned by the, the government. It's not, it's not sanctioned, it's not, at least it's not sanctioned. Right, right. And that happened for, you know, hundreds of years. So we have to appreciate that we're here now and that this too shall pass and the, the resilience, the strength, the character, we, we still have that and we're standing on strong shoulders. But I wanted to talk about learned helplessness. And I wanted to learn about, I want to talk about uh, uh, learned self-efficacy, 
right? So in this time when we're watching all of this stuff happening, the disaster porn over and over and over again, people are, uh, you know, just really um, obsessed with the violence. We have to we have to look at what this is doing and what is triggering. Children aren't always verbal about what goes on. They'll act out. Uh, they'll do other things because they don't have the tools, they don't have the words even to manage what's going on inside of them internally. So I wanted to talk a little bit about um, learned helplessness and learned helplessness, um, you know, is something that was studied uh, behavior, uh, behaviorists and ver various people looked at the fact that uh, they took these animals um, and they took the dogs. I think I told you about this before. They put a, I talk about this stuff so often. Talk about it all the time. Talk about it all the time. So that learned helplessness, if they lock the door, they beat up anybody that goes towards the door. They kill people that go towards the door. Nobody's going through the door. I'm not going. I'm going to just go about not going to the door. Then time passes, and after a while, no one's at the door. In fact, not only is there no one at the door, the door is ajar. It's open. And people still won't go through. They'll go, ask, and probably nothing over there anyway. Or people, the only kind of people that go outside the door, they start making up reasons why they can't go out the door. Right. Now, remember... There's something uh, that's called uh, learning, right? Social learning theory. And social learning theory says that we learn by what is modeled for us. You know, we learn by those people that what the big people are doing. So now, vicarious learned helplessness happens when my my hero, my shiro, whoever it is, won't go through the door. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, you're the most important people, my, person in my life. If you're not going through the door, I'm certainly, I'm right. certainly not going through the door. <laughs> try to go through the door mm. but the opposite is also true right. if you walk through the door the person that i look up to that's my hero my shiro my the person that i depend on and trust then i believe i can go through the door so part of this has to do with walking your talk it's not enough to just sit down and tell you know yeah you know and here's what people every parent says you know baby sweetheart you can be anything you want to be you can be you know, all these different things but they don't see evidence of that in their world mm -hmm. i don't know how much they're going to believe that so sometimes we have to realize that the most important person in a, in a child's life are those big people that they're looking up to mm -hmm. and that means that we have to do the you know really to, to lean into to doing the work and that means i'm not going to tell you how to walk through the door. I'm not gonna do a study on the study <laughs> of how people walk out the door. I'm not gonna, I'm gonna hold your Keep hand. Stories about legends about people who walk through the door. <laughs> yeah, walk through the door. How about we just take them by the hand. I cannot tell you how many environments I've been in where people are going, well, we're gonna, we're gonna do some research about it. We're gonna study. You know, and like, you know, it's like the whole idea that people tell, you know, what's the weather? You say, you look at the news and they say, well, you know, it's going to be, you know, there's a 50% chance of rain and it's raining outside. <laughs> okay. It's a hundred percent chance because it's raining. Now you can keep looking at it and hoping you get it right. Or you can just look outside. Right, right, you know, so right. there, there's a part of this that's very pragmatic. I'm not trivializing it because trauma is trauma and it's real. Mm -hmm. And what happens with children is children can deal with a whole lot more than you think if you talk to them, right? right. If you leave it to their ima little imaginations to try to figure out, oh, no, 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 let's just go leave, go in a room, go out of here. Right. You actually trap the fear inside. Children can- Or the shame, or the shame inside. Or I know when I had work with children um, who'd been abused, and I would work with their parents, and I'm like, listen, they're young enough right now where you can mitigate the harm that this has caused them by asking them exploratory questions, you know? So what happened? Oh, really? Well, you know, well, these are our private, so we don't let people, right? You can have that conversation. And they will sometimes forget whatever even happened. They won't have it in, you know, completely solidified within them. But if you're like, what did they do to you? What, tell me what they, that feeling of terror and shame gets trapped in them and then they can't function. And then you see all these other behaviors that come out of it. Um, and, I think that, and I think that though, but here is a natural reaction to a parent. What happened? Why did I tell you? Know, you start yeah. What was it, the woman you told, uh, the woman who to slap the, slap the person or got angry, the kid was going out in the street and you, and you were, you were, could you tell that story? So, well, what happened was, what, what had, ha what had happened was, had happened. so when I was working as a child and family therapist, um, I had a client who was on paper because her daughter had started a 
fire. And so there were safety hazards, you know, they will snatch our kids up for any reason. So she was considered unsafe, um, but she had visitation with the mom, mostly with the mom. Um, but there were some safety concerns. So I was doing the well home checks, wellness checks. And, um, you know, culturally, there are assumptions that we make about our upbringing, right? And a cultural assumption in this case was that all black kids get beaten. Right. Um, me never having had a spanking in my life, that is not my cultural experience. But um, talking with her, she said, well, I can tell you, I don't beat my kids. Cause you won't, you know, I'm not an abuser. Now, I don't believe she's an abuser. However, you're on paper with the state. That is the state, basically that child's legal uh, guardian is the state. So you can't be delivering corporal punishment while you're on paper being supervised. Like that's not a good look. Um, but I can't say, I'm gonna. I'm not gonna, you know, turn you in, and you know, she's doing corporal, corporal punishment. But I do have to try to find a way to give you um, an option that you can, you know, like you'd make the decision on your own. But at least you have to have some options, right? So, like, if you say, like, people who've said to me before, like, all these kids in jail because nobody spanks them, and I'm like, everybody I know in jail been spanked. So that's not. I mean, <laughs> it's not. I mean, I, I, you know, so. I wanted to give her just some options because I think in her mind, this is the kind of thing that her, the learned, um, the social learning that she was, was modeled for her was that every child needs to be spanked to be corrected. And so I just wanted to give her an option so that she could be curious about whether or not that's true for her, right? Um, but we don't make space for our people sometimes to, to, to do that. So I said to her, I said, so you, you hit your kids sometimes? And she's like, yeah, sometimes. And I said, so tell me about the times that you actually usually hit your, your kids. And she said, um, it's only when they do something dangerous. They do something dangerous. I just, I just want them to know you don't do that. And I just let them know. She said, so if they're like, you know, doing something, they hit their sister, I go, don't hit. And I go, just, <laughs> you're hitting. I hit you to say, don't hit. That doesn't really make any sense, but I let that go. So then she said, well, if you ran a crap right out in the street, and, you know, that would be really dangerous. I'd want to spank them to let them know you don't do that. And so I said, okay. So I, you know, we just talked a little bit more. And I said to her, I said, okay, so, you know, I was thinking that um, sometimes when I'm across the street and I see someone that I think that I know, I get really excited um, and I run across the street to see them. So say I ran across the street to see you and I'm like, hey, and a big semi just, you know, you know passed me and I'm like oh my god I'm, I'm scared I'm, I'm trembling I get across the street and you go <laughs> I said, I'm a grown-ass person and I'll be traumatized that you hit me after you saw I was already scared you know and there's a there's a there's a piece where parents get angry and I know I don't know if it's all parents but I know it's black parents we get angry when our children put us put themselves in danger or harm's way but they're already traumatized so the 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 reaction they're looking for is comfort and love. And we're like, you, you almost hurt yourself. You know, like, I think that's the part that we have to start to examine what that is and why we do it. And, and in the midst of all the stuff that's going on, how we can do things differently so that our children can heal and thrive. You know? I think also there's, um, I was working with uh, Katrina Relief and um, in Portland. And so they had folks that were, you know, bust. Some of them came on the back of truck. It was horrible what, what happened to it. And, and of course, I have a picture in my, in my slide presentation of dogs being on buses. They're being bussed. Dogs and cats are being bussed from Louisiana. And you got people with babies and children on the back of trucks with feces on them, okay, from the flood and everything else. And they get to Portland. And so we're working with these families and we are talking to people and trying to check in. And, and in those conditions, sometimes people got separated and they're in, they're in kind of makeshift families. The truth of the matter is they're, they're like makeshift. And um, you'll have like um, a, a grandmother that's going, go, go see it. Go see about your, your brother. Go, go check on your, you know, your, on your auntie, go check, you know, and I started, there were these two girls, these young teenage girls, they may be 13, 14, you know, go check on your brother, go get your, you know, they, this is what was happening. And it was a while before we figured out that these two girls were extremely traumatized, mm -hmm. extremely. One of them had lost her parents, dead. We didn't even know because 
she didn't have anybody that she was was thrown right into taking care of everyone else and couldn't even grieve. Right. And by the time we found out, I mean, it had been at least a couple of days that she was in Portland. And so I'm thinking about this and I'm going, my God, and usually young girls um, that are quiet. She wasn't saying anything. She wasn't fussing. She was trying to help, but she was devastated inside. Right. right? And so I think that we have to pay attention. Part of, part of this whole thing with COVID, part of seeing over and over and over again, again, the disaster porn, looking at you know, people that are being injured and being harmed over and over again. You know, it does something, it triggers something in us as adults, but remember, there's more likelihood that your children are gonna to respond to you and your response exactly. than what is actually going on, right? It's okay to say to children, that's not all right. That's not, that's not right. But if they see you flipping out, right. it gets internalized in them. And again, it's not always just that simple, but I think that children, believe it or not, even when they're really small, you can explain stuff to them. You can, you can really explain stuff to them. I remember Bahia was um, asked me a question. Of course, not for a religious person. This is like you know, a very interesting question. She said, where do you go when you die? <laughs> right? So I was like, and she was like, I don't know, three and a half, four. Where do you go? Deep, deep questions. It's a deep question. You know, where do you go when you die? And I started getting, I said, well, you know, you have this body, right? And so I started, I was, I was trying to, I was saying, you have a body, but then there's another part of you. I got really deep. And then Mia looked at me, she goes, you know, uh, Auntie Freddie said, you just get closer to God. <laughs> and she was okay with that. She didn't need all the stuff that I was getting ready to try to tell her about the body and the soul and the mind and all of what I'm trying to tell a four-year-old. She said, hey, you know, Freddie just said you get closer to God. What are you talking about? You know what I mean? And, and so, so sometimes I think uh, the simple answer is the best answer. Yep. And, and when it comes to, the, the other thing is I would not, I'm just, I know that people are in close proximity. So, you know, sometimes, you know, there's only one television. Right. Right, everybody's sheltering in place and we're driving each other crazy and we stir crazy. But if there's one television, it may not be suitable to everybody, but everybody's in there anyway, right? I'm gonna watch my, you know, I'm gonna watch my movie or I'm gonna watch whatever. Oh, and you also oh, speaking, got of the, which, speaking of which, when you made me watch The Mac as a child, completely traumatizing. I can't even watch it to this day because I was, I was y'all want to watch The Mac, hair. I needed to get my hair braided. So I had to be subjected to the Mac and the rats in the car. I remember they put them in the trunk. Not confirm nor deny. Yeah, that was terrible. But let me just again. say. But let me just say also. Oh wait, wait. We have some questions. Okay, before we get into that. But yeah, that's questionable. Questionable. But anyway, um, uh, so we have a couple questions. So before we get started, a support circle Detroit said. It seems like parents invest more into their children because they fear their own potential and the discomfort it takes to attain it. Mm. In these mm. instances, is that learned helplessness? Interesting. Mm. Um, you know, I had an experience uh, with a woman. Um, I was doing, I have a model. Anybody who's taking uh, my course uh, and, and those who are taking the next advanced course are gonna, we're gonna really get in depth in the model and how it's being, how it's being used. So I have an educational model, I have a therapeutic model, models that are evidence-based that are being used in communities. And what I try to help people do, first of all, I don't believe that anyone fixes people. I don't, I don't believe that as a clinician, you don't mm -hmm. fix anybody. You know, we share ideas, we share experiences, we, you know, you know, give insights, but we don't, we, you know, we don't fix people. And what I did was, um, and if any of you are, this is going to be great. This is going to be actually a learning experience. I want you to take out a plain piece of paper Okay, everybody get a plane. I'm gonna give you a minute. Yeah, give me a minute to get the paper. <laughs> and I'll talk slowly so that you'll have, you know, if you're still, and a, and a writing, you get a pencil. Don't just get the paper, <laughs> get a pencil or a pen. So what I, uh, I was in a situation where I was working with families and this one family had been evicted. They've been evicted, right? And uh, so when I got in the house, this is what I noticed. I noticed a young boy, maybe about 17, sweeping. There's no furniture in the house. We literally had to sit on the floor. 
because they had been evicted. They, there was nothing there. But there's one teenager, the mother, the teenage boy, another young boy who's younger, maybe about 15, with headphones on, sitting, you know, sitting back, you know, it actually in the uh, on the couch, the only piece of furniture that was there. So he's leaning back with headphones on, and the mother is just just looking, you know, kind of got this blank look on her face. So I walked in, I said, you know, I want to work with you, I want to help you, um, and I want, you know, ask some questions of you. And I said, and, and one of the first questions I, you know, I want to ask is, you know, uh, has this happened before? She said, yes. I said, why do you think it happened? Right. So she began to talk about, you know, well, you know, I had a good job. I lost my job. And, you know, the reason why we're getting kicked out this time is they accused my boys of having a gun. My boys don't have a gun, which was true. They hadn't didn't have a gun. This was when they were trying to move all the black folks out of the particular complex so they could move in people who could pay more money. And it truly was that. And so they said, oh, we heard that your boys had a gun and you, we can't have that. And that's how, why they were evicted this time. But they've been evicted before. So I said, and what I want you all to do is I want you to, at the top of the paper, I want you to draw three boxes right next to each other across the top of your paper. Okay, three boxes. The bottom of the paper, I want you to draw one box like in the middle of the middle box, right? But it's at the bottom of the paper. And in that box, I want you to write behavior, okay? In between the three boxes and the box in the middle, I want you to make a box right on, on top, right above the box on the bottom. And that is intention, intention and decision. So now what we're going to try to figure out is help people uh, figure out why they engage or refuse to engage in a behavior. It could be they smoke, uh, they do drugs, they steal, they won't go to school, it doesn't matter, right? <laughs> Whatever it is, that's the behavior that we're trying to look at. And we're trying to, I'm trying to help them see how they arrived at that box, okay? So in box number one at the top, I want you to say in, the intrapersonal, that is the person, the individual. So you can say individual or person. In the middle box at the top is the interpersonal. So it's the interpersonal environment. So you have the individual, now you have their interpersonal environment. And the third box on the, at the top is their culture, cultural you know, environment, the cultural environment. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna try to, I'm going to give you a real life situation um, you know, of, of how people are able to feel empowered to change the behavior. And it doesn't really matter what the behavior is. So now outside floating around these boxes are attitude. So write attitude outside, right? Um, uh, Self-efficacy and self-esteem, those are out there. Uh, socialization, racial socialization, value systems, all of these are floating around outside these boxes that you have drawn. And all of these things are influencing the decision, that middle box, decision or intention to engage or not engage in that bottom behavior. Now, walked into a house, you know, with uh, the mother with the children that, you know, and, and the, um, the eviction. So the mother, I said, so why do you think this is happening? This behavior of, of being, you know, having kind of a, you know, a pattern of being evicted. And, and the mother, you know, said, well, I, you know, I, I just, I, I don't know. I don't know why I, I end up there. I said, well, let's, let's, let's go up to the top. Tell me who is in the middle box. Now the middle box is family friends, uh, acquaintances, work folks, uh, enemies, everybody's in that interpersonal box. Now what Bahia and I teach is we teach this whole idea that for people of African descent and people of, of uh, Latinx descent, that the highest value is in the relationship with people. So that middle box is actually one of the most important boxes, not the individual, which is where we always focus on the person, and not necessarily even their, their community or their, or their cultural environment. But that middle box becomes very critical about how and why people make a decision 
to engage or not engage in a behavior. Who's influencing the decision. Who's right? influencing and all of these other things are influencing that decision because what we got to get to is why are you deciding this? Right, right. How is this decision somehow influencing this situation that we're finding ourselves in? Hmm. And so I turned to the little, the young man who has his, his, his headphones on. I'm going, I'm only going to be here a short period of time. Take them off. Just a just short period of time. And she said, well, you know, I try to make ends meet, you know, uh, but I, I can't always do it. And I get behind. And I said, well, let me find out about your boys, because I said, do you all go to school? They go, yeah. I said, do you have like, you know, part time jobs or anything? And they all look at their mother. They both look at their mother just immediately. It's like it's like she asked the question. And um, I, they said, you know, they, they kind of put their heads down. I said, so I said to the one who was sweeping, which was odd that you're sweeping up the house you're being evicted from. And I said, well, tell me, would you, you know, you seem to, to, you be, to be trying to clean up that, the house. I think that that's really, you know, uh, commendable. Why, why are you doing that? He says, well, I like to clean things. I said, did you know you can get a job cleaning things? Mm -hmm. And he looks over at his mother, he goes, really? I said, yeah, not only that, you could own a business yeah. where you clean things. And he gets really excited. Right. And I asked the other boy and he said, yeah, well, I, you know, I like he started talking about what he liked to do. I said, so you could possibly get a job and maybe help your mom. Right. Maybe, you know, if you have time after school or on the weekends and then he got really excited. He, this this guy got really excited. And then he looked at his mother and he goes, oh, but but then I then we wouldn't get the check. We, we, get, we, we, we wouldn't get the check. And I said, well, what do you mean? Well, he has a disability. He has, he has a disability and the mother collects the check, which she helps to pay for the rent. And I go, oh, okay. So they get really, really nervous. And so then I start realizing that she is stopping them from growing, themselves. from growing because she needs their, this, because all she can think through is, you know, I, if, if I don't have the check, but then I find out she's developmentally delayed. Right. right. So what she's doing is she's acting out of what she understands. And the other son, you know, one of the son's father takes care of him. The other son's father isn't, isn't present for him. But I said, so why do you think, what, what part of this, this scenario do you think is influencing this condition here? And it was her fear. And the condition of consistently being evicted. Consistently. Right? It was her fear and not seeing, not being able to see any other way. And here this boy wanted to work. Mm -hmm. but did not want to upset his mother because she depended on a check. And if I hadn't sat down on the floor and drawn those boxes and put the people in them, I wouldn't, she, she would have never seen it, right. nor would they. But and, see, so, you go ahead. and so what's important is that, bo that, that piece of paper that you have, I want you to put a behavior in the bottom of that paper, yours, whatever it is. And then I want you to look at the three boxes and say, is it you? Like I had to, you know, figure out, is it, is it you? And part of it was her and her limited ability. So box number one was very important to her deciding those, th those behaviors. But also in box number, in number two, in her world, there wasn't anything that encouraged or showed her another way, right? And then I'm in box number three, I'm in the community. And I now realize that I can, there are people in the community that can help you, right? That she never thought about. So I said, who in your community, who in this box over here, you know, do you think can help you? And then she started to think about other people and other systems and other, she goes, yeah, I could maybe, but you see what I'm saying? And then we talk about a blank sheet of paper and boxes. And that's with anyone. But that's with anyone. When I when I when I look at it, and I know that you know this about me. But anything that we try to tell community members, we test on ourselves. We test on our own family. We test to see if it's actually going to be successful. We don't just put stuff out there that we expect everybody to adopt, right? And so when I looked at this behavior. I put did my own box. My behavior was I was always about fifteen minutes late to everything, <laughs> always. And I had to look at why is that the case. Well, the first thing I realized was that. When I looked at the, the, the decision making, the, the behaviors that were causing that is that I was rushing. And rushing is the enemy of organization, I have to say. So when you're rushing around, you're opening things and you can't find things, you've dropped your keys somewhere because you're rushing around. So I thought, okay, 
So that's why it's, I'm having this late behavior, but then what's influencing me rushing, right? So I started thinking, well, I have to take care of my kids. Well, I'm actually doing all these favors for people I shouldn't be doing. Well, I'm also, you know, uh, putting too much on my plate. So all those things were impacting that. And then when I started to think about what's influencing even those things, my behaviors, those attitudes, I realized that there are a couple of things that were contributing to this. One, I grew up in a house where we, you know, drove our cars. There was no zero, zero gas, <laughs> zero gas. That was the way that my family did. It's like, oh, we're running out of gas. I, it just was a natural thing. Like always just go to get to the last drop. Oh, I'm on fumes. I'm running on fumes. I remember hearing that, that said in my car, I'm running on fumes, which means we are like below E. And I thought to myself, why do I let that happen when it causes me anxiety, causes me to rush, causing me to lose track of things and where I need to be. And then I'm late. So one thing I said, oh, I'm going to stop letting my car go all the way to zero. I'm gonna, when it gets to at least a quarter tank, I start with a quarter tank, then, then I'm gonna go get more gas. So I'm not, so then I don't have to wake up and go, oh my God, I have to get gas, which also makes me late. Same thing I had to start thinking about was, why am I saying yes to everybody who's asking me to do favors for them that makes me late? What is that? So when you start to do that with any behavior, you can start to address that issue when you start to think about the things, people, values, behaviors, history that are influencing your decision to make that, to engage in that behavior. So it's not just for a, an extreme cases. You know, we're talking about that's, we're talking about eviction. That's an extreme case. We, we're talking about frustration, anger, outbursts, cursing, weight loss. Any time that you want to start looking at shifting that outcome, the, the final behavior at the bottom, you have to start thinking about those things that are influencing us. And we are so influenced by the people in our direct, immediate environment and who we have the strongest connections to. You know? let, me, let, me give you another, let me give you another one. So I walked into, and, and again, I actually don't do direct service, but I was, I was actually kind of on ride alongs with uh, the social workers that I, I coach. And what happens is we enter this house and, and the identified client is a, a, a youth who stole a car. He stole a car and that's how he got on paper and that's how his family got in the program. He wasn't even there. He found out we were coming to check on him and he left. So now I'm in the house with the mother and his sister. So the mother, it's just so sweet. She was so warm. Her house was warm. And the sister who's 16 is there. And so I said, well, it's okay. You know, I know he's not, he's not here. I said, so he goes to Rosemary Anderson um, High School, the kid did. And so I asked her where she went to school. She goes, oh, I dropped out. And the mother immediately, you could just see you could see her, her just, she was just, just ashamed and you could feel it. You know, she started kind of, you know, getting kind of nervous. Cause I asked the, the, the daughter, I said, well, why is it you, um, you know, you, you dropped out of, you dropped out of high school. She goes, I, you know, I don't know. You know, it's like that typical kind of, I don't know. I just, you know, I don't know. I said, would you, let's find out why. Mm -hmm. So once again, I had them take out the paper, do the three boxes. And I said, so this box is you. And this is what I told her. I said, now the, the issue is that you, you don't go to school. You dropped out of school. So that's the behavior. I said, but we, let's find out why. Cause you don't seem to know why, but let's find out why. Now, again, the mother is becoming increasingly stressed. I can tell that she's stressed, uh, but, I'm, you know, but I'm not sure why she's stressed. So the daughter goes, you know, I said, so this is the box here. That's you. And that's your, your personality. That's your, your, uh, your, your gifts, your skills, your hobbies, the things you like, that's all you, you know, you know, what you look like. Do you, are you healthy? I told her that's your box. I said, this middle box is your family, your family and friends and all these people. And I explained that. And then I explained the community box where, you know, you where you go, where you would have gone to school, where you, maybe your mother goes to church or goes to mosque or synagogue or whatever. This is where, this is that box. And it's also, you know, maybe um, other social service agencies that you know about in your community. All right, community centers. That's, and I said, well, let's find out why you have decided to not go to school. I said, let's check the boxes. Is it because of an experience you had maybe in one of these institutions, like your, the school you went to? She goes, no, no. And, and the mother is rent, just, just her. You could just tell she's getting increasingly stressed out. So then she, I go, do you think, is it, is it in, in your family? Do you? She said, oh, no, no, I know, I got it, I got it, I got it. She got excited. She goes, I know why. I know why now. I know why I made the decision. I said, why did you make the decision? She says, because I'm not smart. 
and the mother burst into tears. She just burst into tears, got up and left the room. And I said, why do you think you're not smart? You know, cause I, I can't, I just, I can't do it. I can't do it. I said, let me tell you something. <laughs> I said, I'm, I'm going to guarantee you <laughs> that you can graduate from high school. I said, and I started telling her about all different people that graduated from high school and shouldn't have. I said, look, <laughs> yeah, I know people with, you know, you don't have, have to have even arms or legs. You can graduate. She started laughing. I said, you can graduate. For, I can guarantee you that you can. Right. Well, the mother comes back in because she's also looking at these boxes and she's realizing that she did not fulfill her own dreams right. because of the same reason she didn't think she was smart enough. And she never said it, but her greatest fear was that it would be transmitted to her daughter. And I said, okay. I said, well, this is easy. We can fix. Oh, this, this, hey, this is this is easy. I said, I know the school you can go to. I said, I can work with you to get you in there. And the mother got excited. After a while, we got excited. Mother had always wanted to be a nurse. Hmm. Always wanted to go to nursing school, but because of her boxes and some of the people in her boxes, she didn't believe she was smart. That's how many generations it went back. Long story short. Girl went back to school, graduated from Rosemary Anderson High School. Mother went back to, to nursing school. It wasn't because of Dr. Joy. It's being able to uncover the influences that, that, that impact our decision-making. And most people don't think that way. I mean, the average person doesn't think in these boxes. Right. And, and I'm talking about blank boxes. And, the, and when, the, when this young woman, this young girl said, I know, I, you know, she was, she was literally trying to figure it out and said, no, it's not that, it's not that. Oh no, I'm not smart. Mother pinged mother, which pinged mother's experience of her life. Right. And then I said, so can you all do this stuff? I'm just curious. Y'all think you could do it? And they say, yeah, we can do it. I think we can do it. And but that is, but that is you, you planted it. that, but you planted that. And I think that that when we get to, I mean, the main purpose of even going down this road and looking at our um, topic of conversation today really has to do with being curious about what is possible. We know what the existing reality is in this country in terms of the fact that we don't have a blueprint we can give our children to say, hey, this is what you do so that you survive police interaction. We can say, this is what you can try to do. This is what we think is the safest route for you to go. And I think that's important to give our kids. But knowing that there's no guarantee in this racist society that you can protect your children from these institutions and from these uh, officers or from um, other people, um, what do you do to create that sense of joy and love in your, in your immediate environment? And that's when you start to foster a sense of the, the, the uh, culture of learning, being curious about what is possible. And I think about that all the time with my kids, the curiosity is, the, is a, such a buffer because yes. you're like, what can I do? I know I can't do these things. I know I can't control these dynamics. But there's always something that you can do and exploring that with your children. I'm curious, what do you think we could do in this house to make it feel warm and happy all the time? Your children will come up with all kinds of interesting things, you know, and, and those are things that they feel now they have some control over. You know, um, my son yesterday said, you know, I love my bath. It's my favorite. It's my favorite thing. My, my bathtub is, is amazing. But anyway, my son was like, hey, do you think I can take a bath? He was really stressed out. And I said, yeah. He said, can you help me out? I don't, he's not a bath taker, I guess. Anyway, I'm sure. So I go and I put the little Epsom salt stuff in there and I put the candles on. I said, you just, it's nice. You can put the lights down, you put the jets on. So he took a bath. He was like, that was really great. I said, you put the jets on? No, I just, I just stayed in there. It was great. Later on that night, that was the earlier in the day. He said, you think I could take it as a bath? <laughs> You know me, there's nothing, there's nothing like, there's no, no such thing as too much clean. Yes, yes, you may. So he went back and this time he was like, I tried the jets, but it got too hot in there. But again, this is, this is trying to figure out for him, how am I going to navigate my own stress? How am I going to decompress? And I talk about baths all the time. Oh, I got to go take a bath. I've been there for two hours one day. They're like, are you still in there? I'm like, yes, this is my therapy. So even though I've never said, you know, you should try to take a bath. I just take a bath. And so for him, bringing himself down, he thought about it because it, again, it was created as an, as a, as an option for de-stressing. I didn't tell him what to do, but he was curious about whether it would work for him. 
And so for me, I'm, you know, what I try to encourage parents that, that I talk to on a regular basis, is like, how are you fostering creatively in your home options for your kids? How are you giving them, making them curious about what their capacity is? Because if you're not, if you just take what's been given to you, um, a lot of times there's nobody in the family who's encouraging that. There's another piece that I want, and I want to, I want to bring up, uh, I'm going to uh, sh uh, screen, share a screen, because the other thing that's important for, it, for us to do is to get children to talk. Mm -hmm. There's traumatic things going on. In, in, let's be clear. There are traumatic things going on in the world. And when people are all in one space, sometimes they're all seeing that traumatic material. And what we have to do is start creating, our, what I also help families do is create a narrative for the family. It's your, your family narrative um, to begin to tell your story and write your story. You know, it was so sad what happened to that man. If you were going to write a letter to that family, you know, and we could do this with little ones, you know, if you were, if, what would you want to say to them because of you, because of how sad that they are, what would you, what would you want, you know, to say to them? And, and then what kind of, let's make a card. What would that card be? Let's draw a card for that. You see children, are doers. They, they don't want to just sit down and listen. They want to, they want to do. And when they do that, we go, oh my God, I made the card. I said, you know how happy this would, would make someone. Wouldn't you be happy if you received a card like that? You know, and um, I want to show something, a, a piece that I use in my, uh, in my course um, about uh, telling our story. So I'm going to well, share two a story. Things, two things. You did not give me an actual link, just FYI. You gave me. Oh, no, I'm not. I know I'm not. I'm sorry. You know, I'm not using that anyway. So, but, you, but I just want you to know that you freaked me out. Because <laughs> I was trying to get rid of the link. I was like, not only is it not a link, it's not blue. It doesn't even. It doesn't give me the option. It was just a whole bunch of letters. So Whatever, but yeah. Anyway, just <laughs> you, next time you're gonna give me a link. Make it an actual link. Whatever. Okay. So, see, I had a whole PowerPoint here just in case. <laughs> you know, I should have just sent you that. Um, th this link. Uh, but. You know. I'm, I'm learning technology, friends. Help me, work with me. Uh, so now we got to do this. Let's see. I'm sorry. I got to do the slideshow, right? Yeah, go ahead. Definitely. Slideshow, play from the start. Okay, so we don't want that one. Learning how to build relationships. You don't have right? that much time either. I, I, whatever. You know, I have a little bit of time. So I'm going to move to... Uh, That's what I wanted you to do, by the way. That's it. That, that was, you, you don't you see this. this is the wrong link. I don't know. I tried. I did the best so I could. This is a link. It's blue. But the link that I had last was not this. It was just. I should have just sent you the PowerPoint. Then you would have been able to find it. I would have had it. Oh. Anyway. Oh, look at, look at the pumpkins. Um, and I wanted to show kind of a series of these. You know, this was, what was it? Black Girl Magic? Uh-huh. No, Black it was uh, Why I Rock. Why I Rock. Why I Rock. And this was. Um, this was Sherelle. Two for yeah, one. So Bahia had, you know, it was involved with uh, the, a community event, which was specifically looking at targeting black girls. And look at some of the things that they're writing about in response. My community is important to me because. So in other words, you don't always have to focus on what's negative. We can focus on positive things. And these are things that you can do. You don't have to have a whole crowd of people. You can do this in your, in your home. Mm -hmm. um, just some pictures of the girl. In my community, we need better access to and uh, books, uh, black owned business. These are what the girls themselves wrote, uh, safer homes, diversity, more black people. Um, you know, it, it was just really a wonderful, uh, just a, a, a festival of love for young girls. Um, but I wanted to talk about constructing a narrative. Uh, one of the great no oral traditions of Africa is telling, uh, is storytelling. The griot or storyteller is an important holder of, I'm going to say knowledge because I can't move it, holder of history and provides the community with knowledge of the past and connects that historical memory with the present in order to guide the community towards the future. Uh, what you're looking at is, a, is, I brought back from South Africa, this, the, this particular uh, uh, picture, this is woven into a carpet, um, is seen over and over again how important the storyteller is. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to read this piece about, uh, and this was uh, taken from two, 2013, the stories that bind us. Uh, it was in the New York Times. So if you want to see the, the whole article, this isn't the whole article. I just took out what I thought was important. 
Sarah, a psychologist who works with children with learning disabilities, noticed something about her students. The ones who know a lot about their families tend to do better when they face challenges, she said. Her husband was intrigued and along with a colleague, Robin Fivish, set out to test her hypothesis. They developed a measure called the Do You Know Scale that asked children to answer 20 questions. Examples, do you know where your grandparents grew up? Do you know where your mom and dad went to high school? Do you know where your parents met? Do you know an illness or something really terrible that happened in your family? Do you know the story of your birth? Dr. Duke and Dr. Fivish asked those questions of four dozen families in the summer of 2001 and taped several of their dinner table conversations. They then compared the children's results to a battery of psychological tests the children had taken and reached an overwhelming conclusion. The more children knew about their family's history, the stronger their sense of control over their lives, the higher their self-esteem, and the more successfully they believed their families function. The do you know scale turned out to be the best single predictor of children's emotional health and happiness. I'm bringing this up because of what we're going through right now and how critical it is in terms of our mental and emotional health. And then something unexpected happened. Two months later was September 11th, 9-11. As citizens, Dr. Duke and Dr. Fibish were horrified like everyone else. But as psychologists, they knew they had been given a rare opportunity. Though the families they studied had not been directly affected by the events, all the children had experienced the same national trauma at the same time. The researchers went back and reassessed the children. Once again, Dr. Duke said, the ones who knew more about their families proved to be more resilient, meaning that it could moderate the effects of stress. Why does knowing where your grandmother went to school help a child overcome something as minor as a skinned knee or as major as a terrorist attack? The answers have to do with the child's sense of being part of a larger family. Dr. Duke said that the children who have the most confidence, self-confidence, have what he and Dr. Fivish call a strong intergenerational self. They know they belong to something bigger than themselves. Yes. I, I, I always use this particular, um, this particular piece. I, th these are just family pictures. Um, and again, I think that family becomes very, very critical. And when we start looking at what we're experiencing, and I'm gonna come out of this, I'm not, I know we don't have time. Um, how do I get out? That's what I did. And then I stopped sharing some kind yes. of- Yes, yes. Well, I'm trying to figure out how to- Go to the bottom, hover at the bottom and it should okay. give you- Okay, oh, there we go, stop. Okay. Okay, so we have a couple more questions before we okay, get- Okay, okay. Um, so, so just, just to recap, just to recap, we talked okay. about Kassir and Garrett, we talked about how are the children? We talked about societies where the society's health and well being is based on the wellness of the children, right? And we talked about our society, which is a racist environment that we are raising Black children and how we are trying to foster love and balance and healing within them. We gave some examples and some ideas around changing behavior and giving people and kids pop, uh, possibilities. And now we're moving into um, telling our stories and being able to use that as a tool for creating, not only addressing trauma, uh, but also creating self-efficacy and pride and all of those things. So moving from there, I'm just trying to bring everybody through. Bring, to, every, bring everybody around. Okay. It's a through line. It's a through line. Um, so we have a question that talks about, um, well, one person wants to know how you can get a copy of their book to you, but I'm just gonna tell you, dear top fan on Facebook, Tanya, it's not gonna happen. <laughs> just, unless you go to one of her events, you, she, you'll send it to her and it will never make its way back to you. I'm sorry. I just going to be honest. What, what is she asking? I'm sorry. I'm trying to get you to sign their book. They want to get their book to you. For and, me to sign it and send it back? Oh, wait, wait, wait. Maybe it's their book. No. How can I get a copy of my book to you? I don't, I don't know. You're going to, I don't know that that's possible at this point, right? Not right now, but we'll figure it out. I mean, maybe in the future at an event, but I don't see how else you're going to get your, okay. So, send the book to, to, oh. No? Okay, I guess that's true. Oh, that's right. <laughs> I'm in the middle of moving too. So anyway, all right. Okay. So um, Kim uh, Beverly Muhammad asked, how do you get a 14-year-old boy to talk who hasn't experienced any trauma? One, he may have experienced trauma that you don't know, but let's just let that go. And okay. also my son treats us like we're bothering him. We try to engage him in basic conversation. <laughs> 
Listen, listen, I didn't always love this lady here as much as I do now. I love her. I've always loved her. I didn't always like her. So when I was a 15 year old child, I definitely acted that way. <laughs> so as close as we are now, that should give you a tiny bit of hope that things will probably change. Um, well, boys also tend to be less verbal and just in general. Yeah. And, um, but I would find, you know how, this is going to sound very strange, but you know how people, they have, have a book called The Love Languages, mm -hmm. right? You've got to, you've got to find out what his language is in terms of engagement. Uh, sometimes it's, you know, video games. Sometimes it's, you know, it's what, what I've had to do to get the attention of my sons over the years, right? Is I really had to figure out what was important to them uh, and to, and to have curiosity and interest in what, was interesting to them. Uh, I remember sitting down and I'm so horrible at video games. I play games with my grandkids all the time, all the time. I, and I recently learned, what's Uno, it called? Uno Attack. Uno Attack. And, it, and I never, I had never played Uno. And we were up all night playing Uno Attack because you push the buttons and it shoots out at you, shoots the, the cards <laughs> out at you. And it was so much fun. And I played it a couple of different times with my, my granddaughter and her friends because that's what they play. Right. You know, I had a, a, way, a time way back when my, my grandson was teaching me how to play a game, which was like, shoot me in the face. I was like, I want to gnaw my arms and legs off. But it was so, and he was so um, excited about teaching me how to do it. And, and again, well, I did learn. This back was for the little creation of the creatures. Oh cool. my God, it was just, <laughs> it was just that game. That, that you know he liked creatures that was the other thing and he wanted to share it all with me and I just let him and as a result of that you know I was I was in Portland not long ago and I spent uh the day with my grandson and it was wonderful he drove me first of all he drove the he car loved that. He loved and I'm telling you I loved it more than him because you got to drive Miss Daisy I'm not driving I've been driving for too long so when I have someone that can drive I'm not driving so he got, I got in the car and he goes what I said, oh, no, you're driving. So I handed him the car, the keys. And what was wonderful is we had this exchange while he was driving. Mm -hmm. Now, let me explain that. My grandson and I have, we, you know, we've always been able to talk. But he's also an introvert because we talked about it. He says, I'm an introvert. Uh, and it's much harder for an introvert to act extra in an extroverted way than the opposite. Extroverts can be quiet and shut up. Believe it, we can occasionally. <laughs> um, but it's much harder the other way around. Yeah. So here I am driving around the city with my, my grandson having a conversation where he doesn't have the anxiety of the direct, mm -hmm. you know, one-on-one. -on -one. So he's, he's focused on driving, but he's able to talk and engage with me. And as I'm sharing things, I say, you know, my son, Nadim, is an, and, he, and I said it, he, he finished the sentence, he said, he is an introvert. And he said, with extrovert tendencies. I said, right. <laughs> I said, but we, but so Nadine's natural way of being is he likes being by himself at home with his family. Not, I mean, that's where he regenerates. Now he will come out and do things, but that's where his natural state of comfort is. And, right. and my grandson says to me, me too, me too, Emo, me too. And so what, what, what I'm saying to you about that 14 or 15 year old that isn't is to find his space. And, and to be genuinely interested in, in what's, what's happening with them, right? Um, and that's not being, you know, they all know when you're being patronizing. So what are you doing? You <laughs> what know, are you interested in? What are you interested in? <laughs> don't, don't, don't do that, right? Mm -hmm. Find out the things he really is interested in and get interested in it. I'll tell you when I-, I Ask I, questions about it. Ask questions about it. Like just say, questions. you know, I was looking to, I was trying to figure out how to do this thing. And I know you know a lot about it. You know, can you tell me? And then they're going to, he's going to act like you're an idiot, but he will help you. Will and help then you me. will, you'll, you'll get him to talk a little bit usually. And I, and I think also I say, I speak highly of my, my grandchildren. I speak highly of my children. Um, and, you know, sometimes, you know, like any family, you know, everybody's a hot mess somewhere at some point, right? We all have issues. But it doesn't mean that, you know, I, I, I don't love you. It doesn't mean that we, this too, you know, won't pass. Uh, and, and again, I wanted to say about the narrative is, is they're oscillating. The healthiest narrative is the oscillating narrative, not the one where, you know, we've been doing well, we've always done well, we're going to continue to do well. The one where we say, you know, remember at some point the house burnt down and then your uncle was arrested. <laughs> 
And then, you know, but, you know, we lost everything, but then we got it again. And, you know, but we still have each other, you know, no, whatever. My favorite, it is. my favorite is, but did you have to shovel shit? <laughs> oh, God. oh, my goodness. We're going to ignore that behavior. <laughs> That was my favorite. That, oh. that that behavior we're going to we're going to ignore. Oh, oh. Another question. What's the other question? You see? Oh, one? sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, sorry. Uh, this oh, is why this, this is why we don't drink. No, no we cannot. We don't do any <laughs> sort of drugs. Living this, right, here, right. This here. Is what gets us going? This Can you imagine <laughs> what would happen? It's just you know, it would, wait, be, it would be ugly. Wait, be. wait. Let me just say this one thing though. You know, my mom and I have this weird thing that we do. And this is the thing that I think is interesting about fostering relationships with people that you like. My mother and I are, are very, we have a similar values. You know, I think she influenced me in a lot of ways, but we're like spirited in the sense that the way that we perceive information in a given moment will elicit a, a response that happens so naturally that it sounds in stereo. We respond, yes, that's and true. it happens all the time. We respond exactly yeah. with the same cadence, same intonation <laughs> in a moment. And it's bizarre. It's bizarre it is because so bizarre. when it happens, it's like we said it at the exact like, same time did you? with the exact same intonation. It was just, it's weird. And we just go, me, look, I just have to give an example because nobody will understand this. And this is all sidebar, but you know, we have the, we have the floor. So you guys are behind <laughs> us. <laughs> but so look, time. Uh, okay, but look, th th this is just an example. So one time my mother has this thing where this is like deep, deep I, the thoughts about, from, about Dr. Joy that no one else gets to know. So here's your like, dun, 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 dun. my mother loves, if she finds something that she really likes, she will buy multiple of them in different colors. Now I tell her that takes away the specialness <laughs> of that item because now you have four in four different colors. But she had found these pair of boots and they were on sale at Nordstrom. She was super excited. And notice, notice I said Nordstrom, not Nordstrom's, but anyway, at Nordstrom, she had found- uh, oh, You used to say Nordstrom. No, you say Nordstrom's and I pointed out to you that it's not Nordstrom. I thought you it's saying it too. Nordstrom. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, so she found these boots and she was super excited about them. She's like, they're on sale, they're great, blah, blah, blah. And then she was like, they didn't have them in black. They only had them in brown, but they had them in black at another store. So we go to the next store to get the other exact same pair of boots that but on sale. And we get there and the lady's like, these boots are not on sale. And she's like, no, uh, -uh they were on sale. She pulls out her receipt, she shows them. And the lady basically says, they weren't on sale in the other place. <laughs> that, that guy gave you a sale, he was wrong. That wasn't a sale. So she walks away and me and mom go, and it, it, it literally was exactly what we both said, well, you benefited from it. And she was like, well, I benefited from it. Like as soon as it happened, it happened exactly the same way. And I think, but I think part of that is, 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 is the relationship that we have developed over the years comes from a place of mutual respect and always assuming the highest potential in the person that you're with. So when I think about my children, and although it also kind of frustrates my mother sometimes, but I think I'm always thinking about engaging them at their highest potential. You're not right now, I'm not seeing you at your best self, but I'm, I'm projecting to you that I love that part of you that is your best self. Always projecting those things. Now, when you're not doing your best self, I mean, we have to acknowledge that what you're not doing, but always speaking to the fact that I know and I believe in your capacity to be better. And my mother always did that for me. It was like, but yeah, what do you what do you want to be when you grow up and what kind of person you want to be and i'm like this and that and she's like and how are you going to get there on this terrible path that you're on <laughs> right now you can't go uh left to get right but yeah, you know and that was always the the language but it was never because you're a miserable person because you aren't smart because you don't have this capacity and so i think that with us we need to and i think a lot of it is, is trauma-based we need to be so um like not being stingy with our love and praise of our children. They're not gonna be perfect ever in life. But what you see, what you beam to them, in, especially oh, no, the Ruha. world is, yeah, go Ruha, speak to Ruha. Uh, Benjamin talks about beaming that, that love to children. When you beam that to them, they feel it. When you light up for them, right? When you talk about, mom talks about, 
lighting up for kids or clapping for them or showing them that it buffers them from the society that tells them that they're worthless and that their lives don't mean anything. Um, and and we, we should be empowered to do that. You know, it's we- a kid. It's, a, it's a, my, my um, Oscar actually, I, it was Oscar or Latif that showed me uh, this little video of a little kid. He must've been like, I don't know. He had to be even a little bitty guy. And he had his, his uh, karate gi on, his little white gi. And, and, and in order for him to get his white belt in this particular, uh, I got, I thought you started with a white belt. I did. But anyway, he, he was earning his white belt and he was like three. And what he had to do was break a perforated, it's a perforated little board so that he's got to go in the guy first he practices and he steps and a little kid steps with him. And then he goes, okay, now it's time. So he puts it across the two little bricks and he puts a little perforated board and he jumps up on it with both feet and he stands on it and he goes like, no. So he gets that and he practices again. And then he says, okay. So then he figures out what he has to do because he practiced with the, with, the, with the coach and then he steps on it and nothing happens. And then he steps on it again and nothing happens. And then the guy pushes the little thing out a little further. Because remember, it's a little perforation, right? So he steps on it and it breaks. And the little kid throws his hands up. He's so excited. And they do this kind of ceremonial thing to give him his belt. And it was so precious that this kid was like, it was like he had just won, you know, the Academy Award. He was so excited. And you could just see this and again it was it was giving him an opportunity to win yes give your children an opportunity to win you know we i remember um i like i said a matter of fact if you go through my um my facebook if you're a facebook friend you'll see that i tell a story of uh, the fact that everybody in my family had a trophy for something yeah. right and i had reached my 60s and I've never gotten a trophy. I even got, I, you know what I said, I got first place and it was a ribbon. I got first place and it was a I'm going, why can't I get a trophy? Everything that I actually won, I never got a trophy. And I didn't want anybody, you know, I wanted to earn a trophy. And so somebody heard about the story and I was at a conference and they, I had my trophy right over here. I have my very first trophy. And it was like, for me, I, I never could, uh, it, for me, it was like never having won. Mm -hmm. Not really, because it's not a win unless your little name is a little trophy. <laughs> and, and I know that sounds crazy, but wins are important. Mm -hmm. You know, some kids never get the A. They get A minus or B plus, or they never get on the deals list. <laughs> or whatever it is they're trying to do. But we can create wins. Yep. Create wins for your children um, and celebrate them. Everyone needs a win yeah. and, and, it, and it destroys doubt. It destroys grief. It destroys all of that. Just a win. Right. So I want to encourage you to, and because we all need wins. I mean, one way or another, I think I don't need big wins. Uh, I tell people that I'm probably as happy and as healthy as my children and my grandchildren and my family and the people that I love are. Mm -hmm. And that can't always be because everybody's not always well or sane or whatever but I'm, I'm tuned into them. I love them and I celebrate every day. I feel my win. I'm looking at one of my wins right here, you know, and knowing that when I'm not here, that she's going to continue to do for people and to be kind and to be loving and smart and all of those other things. But that's my win. And it brings me joy. It brings me joy too. But I will say that I think that, um, one of the things that is, is super important because we are stressed and, and not to give you, don't give yourself a hard time if you're not always able to be in that way, but be very, so be careful with yourself. But I think also give yourself permission to just beam. You may not have it all together, but you can think about the one thing that made you feel good in your life and you can beam that thing outward to, to, to your kids. And I think in the middle of all this, the children need light. They need light and hope. And so, um, you know, when you, when you just spend your time doing that, that is what will be implanted in them. Um, and, you know, and we trust say, what you put in them. I want to say this to parents, trust what you put in. I mean, they, you know, there are points where I looked at my children, I was thinking, <laughs> who are you? Are you Satan spawn? I just don't know. 
you know, because when they would, I would look at them and I go, I pray to paint off the walls for them when they didn't have good sense. And thank God there were people who prayed for me when I didn't have sense to, to pray for myself or take care of myself. But, you know, but, but, but do, you know, uh, understand and embrace and love what you have put in and trust it, trust it. It may not show up now, but trust, believe me, just like you did, you started hearing your parents' words. You know, when your parents tell you something, you're like, I just can't stand, she always telling me that. And then all of a sudden they go, wow. And those words come back and they realize they're, they're relevant. So trust what you put in, it'll, it'll, it's still there, even though they seem like they don't like it. They okay. won't. So we are taking it home with that. Taking it home. We're, probably gonna, we're always going to revisit this topic over over time because it's hard. We need to be reinfused and reinforced, and we want to encourage everybody to um, celebrate. Also, yourself. You're alive. You're breathing. You're trying your hardest every single day, and that is enough, right? It's enough, and it's worthy of your own uh, us beaming that light to you, also, right? So. Remember and that? talk to other people. I say talk to other people. We yeah. need to connect and connect with folks. You're not by yourself. You know, like I said, I looked at them. I thought they were mutants. Someone had stolen them. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, like Y'all were mutants at different points, too. Absolutely. I think I was a mutant. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so, and next, next week, we're going to be talking about yeah. allies. Allies or all lies. Oh. <laughs> all lies. All lies. No, but, but really talking about what, is, what does it really mean to be an ally, especially if you're white um, and what it's not. So we'll be talking about that next week. Um, thank you for tuning in as usual. I hope that the rest of your week is uh, wonderful and um, continue to fight. Yes, I know right. Brianna Taylor's killers are still on the loose. It must that's be. Right. We need to keep, keep, keep saying that. The other thing I wanna say, and of course it's me and I'm a grandmother and you guys are gonna say she's old, but I really believe we should stay in for this fourth I just feel like it's, it's, you know, people, things, have, they've shut down the this, this celebrations in cities. And I'm just really concerned that people are going to get out there and do crazy stuff. So just take care of yourself. Maybe you could just, you know, do a little barbecue in the backyard or on the porch or somewhere. Um, but tell some stories. Use it as an opportunity to tell your stories. That would be, which would be yeah. 4th of July story time. Do yeah. that to, yeah, be the healing story time is actually going to be replacing the 4th this year. So tell your stories to your children and your family. Get somebody in your family to tell you some old stories. Um, that would be awesome. We would love that. And shout out to Organic Oneness, our friend Saida, who has an amazing um, organization called Organic Oneness out of Chicago, doing amazing things in efficacy and community. And of course, shout out to the Black Parent Initiative, the program yeah. that I run. And we are doing good things at BPI. So if you want to support us, support the Black Parent Initiative and buy the honey. Say again? What? what is it? Chai. Oh, the Community Healing Initiative. Yes. Community Healing Initiative works with gang impacted youth in Portland, Oregon, doing good things. I'm trying to think of other organizations we're thinking about. Um, I can't think of them all now, but we'll shout them out later. All right. Good night, everybody. Bye. We're over, but we started late.